So good morning everyone. Uh, last time we were looking at the plane waves and we looked at a few solutions of the Helmholtz equation. Now we are going to look at what we talked about the last time about Doppler effect. So by Doppler effect, we mean that if the source were to be moving uh, relative to the observer or to the measurement, what would happen is that as the waves are produced, if the source was coming towards you, then the frequency that you'll hear will, will tend to be higher because the waves that are formed, especially when you look at sound waves, they become shorter and shorter. Although the, the source is producing the same frequency sound, you apparently hear a different kind of a pitch, so to speak. I did ask you guys to stand by a roadside and listen to, to, the, to the sirens as of our ambulances as they come towards you and then and they leave or they go past you. And I, maybe you appreciate what it is we are talking about. So. Doppler effect, although it, you can demonstrate it easily with the sound, it's also it's a phenomenon for all waves, so to speak, including electrodynamic waves. So we say that if there is a relative motion between a time harmonic source and a receiver, the frequency the frequency of the wave that is detected by the receiver will appear to be different from that of the emit that emitted by the source. And this is what is called Doppler effect after Mr. Doppler who studied this effect. Now we consider a source of a harmonic time dependent wave with a frequency of f and the source is moving at a velocity v that is directed at an angle theta in the direct line Connecting, connecting the source at t equal to zero to the receiver R. That is the source S and the receiver R. This, the source would be moving, say for example, suppose you are working with the safari form and you are, you are on their van, the van that is transmitting, you are trying to test how the, your reception is or your signals are. So you, you will be in the van, and you'll be emitting the antenna that is emitting or radiating the, the signal will be moving with the band. So you are moving with it and you're moving in that direction. Here is one of your colleagues trying to receive <coughs> that signal. So what we are saying is that as the source is moving, you will produce a frequency F, but R will not uh, experience the F. He won't be able to measure F but you measure a different frequency rather than what the source is emitting. Now, the wave emitted by the source S at a time t equal to zero will arrive at the receiver at a time t r equal to r naught by c. That is the time as measured at the receiver. That would be the time as measured at the source. At a later time t equal to delta t, where we are going to say that delta t is small, the source will have moved through a distance given by the modulus of the velocity multiplied by delta t. That is the speed of the, of the source and multiplied by the time duration that it has been moving. And the wave that will be transmitted at this new position will arrive at r at a time t2 given by the time elapsed at the source plus the time it would take that signal to arrive at the source at, at the receiver end where r prime is the new distance between the source and the and the and the, and the receiver so to speak and then we, we can write r r prime in terms of the cosine rule that is theta 
So r prime squared is going to be given by r naught squared plus that distance squared minus twice that distance multiplied by that distance and the cosine of the angle between the two vectors or the two lines there. So, and therefore, when we do that, we make the correction and pull out the r naught squared out and therefore we get one minus that value there this should be divided by r naught not it should it shouldn't appear like this should have an r naught squared under it as well so if that that distance moved by the source is small compared to the intervening distance at t equal to zero then we can use binomial theorem or binomial expansion and expand the square root into the following form that is because it's a square root, the two that was there is now divided by, well, just it's removed when we put the half there. And therefore the T2 is going to be given by delta T plus R0 by C into one minus V modulus modulus delta T cos theta and R0. So the elapsed time as reckoned at the receiver corresponding to delta T at S is then given by delta t prime equal to t2 minus t1 that is the time measured at r and therefore we see that that is just going to, going to be delta t into 1 minus the speed divided by the speed of light and multiplied by the cosine of theta and this we see is not going to be equal to the time elapsed as reckoned by this more by the uh, the source or at the source of speed now, if you were to define that that duration is uh, equivalent to the frequency, uh, reciprocal of the frequency of the source, uh, source signal, then you can see that the apparent signal frequency received at R will be given by F prime equal to one by delta T prime. And then we see that it's going to be the actual frequency produced by the source divided by a correction factor which is one minus the speed of the source times the cosine of theta, that is the intervening angle between the source and the whatever, and the, the velocity vector and the direction of the source, uh, the receiver from the source divided by C. And this is approximately going to be given by F into one plus the speed of the source divided by the speed of light and the cosine of theta. The reason why we have it is because we know that C is usually very large and the source the speed v is going to be small anyway because according to einstein's uh, relation or uh, condition no particle with finite mass can move beyond at the speed of light so the speed of light is the almost the limit in the universe so this result has been used mainly in Doppler radar, that is for trying to detect the speed of the of a plane, okay, or the speed of, you know, you can also look at the, you can detect moving objects in the sky. And the other thing you can see with Doppler radar is the police gun or the police speed gun which they point at, that, at a whatever, at a driver or a car and receive the reflected wave from the car and the, the frequency of that reflected wave received by the gun receiver will be different from V and we can see that that F is proportional to the speed at which that vehicle is moving at and therefore if the frequency is higher when the car is approaching you you can always get it as that. If the theta is equal to pi, then the speed will be getting smaller. But but usually there, there are there are whatever the policemen will be in front of the car, and therefore they'll always be getting the speed as to which you'll be moving at by that correction. So the the transmitter or the police gun will be producing a a wave with a frequency of about 10.5 to five gigahertz and therefore if what he receives is different is uh is different from that 10 
0.525 gigahertz and by how much he can always tell what speed you are moving at since often it will be just in free space so to speak so the expression however does not hold when theta approaches pi by two because then this becomes zero and it tells you that the f you should be receiving should not be the same as you should actually be the same as the f you have there but then some of the assumptions that we have already made will become invalid as well as we were trying to derive this value here because now the cosine rule will no longer work okay for getting the values of r prime so the electric we look at what we call the wavelength the wavelength like i said is the if you are having a sinusoidal wave in space the distance between two adjacent crests or two adjacent troughs is usually called the wavelength it's the repeating distance of that particular wave so an electric field intensity distribution will have a spatial periodicity that is in space or in distance that is given by that is uh, just twice pi and this will be given by the wave number of that wave divided by okay multiplied by the wavelength which is lambda and it should give you two pi so that the wave number is going to be given by twice pi divided by lambda itself now if we were to write c is equal to one over root uh, root mu epsilon like we have already shown then we can see that k can be given which was defined before for us as omega equal to as omega multiplied by root mu epsilon then we can see that that one is the same as omega divided by c okay the speed of the electromagnetic wave in the medium and it's equal to twice pi divided by lambda so the wavelength can also be defined if you are looking at the wave from a different direction you would be up, uh, it would be possible to measure a different wavelength you'll see a different wavelength say for example if you are looking if the wave was moving in the positive z direction and you are looking at, at the wave from the x direction then you would be able to define or let's say you would be, be able to define a value uh, let me repeat that again if the wave was moving in a direction say given by x cap multiplied by x plus y cap multiplied by y and z cap multiplied by z that is a direction r which is different from the basis or the coordinate axis then we look at the wave from the x direction the y direction or the z direction we would be able to measure a different wavelength to us that is you are projecting the wave onto the x axis you should be able to get a wavelength twice pi divided by kx if you projected it onto the y axis you get a, a wavelength two, uh, of two pi divided by ky and in the z direction you get two pi divided by kz where if you recall that kx ky and kz were the separation constants that we dealt with before and they were given as k squared plus kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared is equal to the actual wave number of the wave which we say it was k itself so since kx and ky and kz must obviously be smaller than k given that k squared is equal to kx squared plus ky squared plus kz squared then we see that the wavelengths as measured from the different from the directions different from the pro pro direction of propagation would be larger than lambda so from there we can look at what we call the phase velocity imagine yourself the wave is moving as a sine wave in wave in in in, uh, in whatever in the in space and you are riding on it that is you are going on it 
just imagine you are walking or we are looking at the way a camel walks and we look at you are going up and down as the camel is walking so you will you are you are we can say that you are displacement with respect to the camel will always remain constant so to speak so we say that on the wave we can look at points of which at which the faces are constant so we say that a constant face plane or a wave front on that wave must satisfy the condition that omega t minus k dot r is equal to a constant if you remember that we, we already saw that the actual electric field and the magnetic field intensities when given with a cosine reference and uh, reference uh, function what well, the argument was omega t minus k dot r and we call this a retarded kind of uh, a retarded expression or a uh, field so to speak and if that is equal to a constant then we can always differentiate this argument with respect to time t and we get the following that dr dt is going to be given by a value we'll define it as vp and we can see that it's going to be omega divided by the k cosine of theta but remember omega by k is the same as the speed of light c or the electromagnetic wave c and therefore we see that dr dt or vp which is now a speed is going to be given by c over cos theta but cos theta can never be larger than if you were to take the modulus of cos theta it can never be larger than unity and therefore we see that this vp is going to be higher than c and we now start uh, punching ourselves in the face because we are violating Einstein's relation. That is Einstein's condition which says nothing in the universe can move beyond the speed of light C. But we shall see that we really haven't, uh, it's not a, a whatever, it's not a, a violation, but it's because we are looking at the projection of the speed on a, onto a given direction. And we shall see that in many cases the energy transported by the wave will be given by or will be transported at a, with a velocity that is lower than c or equal to c. So vp is therefore usually defined as the phase velocity in the direction of the field point r. Remember r, r the vector r was the what was the observation uh, position vector. The wave may be moving in the the wave will be moving in the direction of k or k star and therefore we are looking at that speed as we are measuring in our direction how does it advance towards us so we note that with the cos theta equal to okay we'll say the modulus of cos theta equal or less than unity and vp is greater than c but the physical width does not violate Einstein's condition as the energy transport will still be at a velocity limited by C. With this, we shall show in a few, in a, in a, in a later, as we continue with this discussion. Now, we look at, that was a plane wave propagation in media that, in a medium that was lossless. It was homogeneous and linear as well as isotropic. It had the same properties in all directions, the same properties everywhere throughout space, and it was also linear, such meaning that if I had an electric field E1 and an electric field E2, the resultant wave would have an electric field that is in a vector sum of E1 and E2. Now, if the medium is lossy, we can always represent this by introducing a conductivity of the medium. So when a time varying electric field is applied to a material body, we expect that there will be small displacements of the bound charges that will occur, thereby distorting the charge distribution 
around the molecules that make up the medium. And this, we call it uh, volume polarization in this material. The polarization vector will vary at the same frequency as the applied field if the, field, uh, the frequency of the field is low, because then the particles that are being displaced can follow the field properly. As we increase the speed, the inertia, the mass inertia of the, of the particles themselves will therefore stop them from following the frequency and they'll kind of not be able to follow it and will remain almost constant, so to speak, or in one direction, so to speak. So, the polarization vector will therefore come out of time phase with the applied field and this will lead to what we call frictional damping mechanism, which we'll call it at, uh, what is it called? A dielectric kind of uh, dissipation. Now, if the medium has an appreciable free carrier concentration as well, e.g. we are dealing, say, for example, we are trying to see how a, a dielectric or a electromagnetic wave will be moving through a, a silicon wafer, Okay, or a, an IC, so to speak, uh, uh, fabricated on silicon, then we would see that we'll have a finite conductivity because the conductivity is the ability of carrying current, okay, in that material. And therefore, we'll have ohmic losses. Now, the good thing is that when you look at the and the ohmic losses and the damping losses of the dielectric, they all lead to heat, that is to the heating up of the media. And as far as we are concerned, the only thing we can measure for us is the heating effect of that loss. And therefore the two of them will be equivalent as far as the external effects are concerned. And we shall see that we can always combine these two uh, effects into one loss mechanism, so to speak, or one loss parameter. So, in a source-free lossy medium, that is a region of the medium that is source-free, that it doesn't have any free charges or it doesn't have any current, uh, current density there, the conduction current will flow, but the only thing, the only field that will be affected by the flow of a conduction current will just be the magnetic field intensity. It's the only one that depends on J. So if we have harmonic time dependent fields, we therefore write that the kernel of it, that is the ampere circuit or law, is going to be given by J, the conduction current that this is flowing, plus the displacement uh, current density. Okay, And this we see is just going to be equal to the sigma which is, we, we are saying that J is equal to sigma E, and that is going to be given by J omega because of the DDT and multiplied by epsilon of E. Now, the curl of, of in the Faraday's equation, if we take the curl of E, can we, we get the following. But the curl of the curl of E is going to be given by the minus time derivative of the, or the time rate of change of B, and we can see that that is why I'm going to be given by minus J omega mu into sigma plus J omega epsilon multiplied by E. Or when we expand the curl of the curl of a vector, we get that the curl or the gradient of the divergence of that vector minus the sigma squared or the Laplacian of D is equal to that value. Now, since we said we were dealing with a source-free region, we can always set that the divergence of E is going to equal to zero, and therefore the Helmholtz equation of interest is then the homogeneous equation that is given by the equation of E minus J omega mu into sigma plus J omega epsilon uh, multiplied by C by E is equal to zero. This equation now, we see that it's no longer omega squared plus omega squared mu epsilon e uh, epsilon multiplied by e like we had and which we call k. We'll now give this one a new symbol which we shall call gamma squared. 
and therefore he expresses it as the Laplacian of P minus the gamma squared multiplied by the P is equal to zero. Remember, if you look at this value here, it means that this value here, when we take it to the other side, we we'll have to get a square, and therefore we get it that is going to be given by a real part alpha plus an imaginary part j beta, which is equal to the root of j omega mu into sigma plus j omega epsilon. We can always remove the j omega epsilon out, and we divide through by it, and we see that it's just going to be given by j omega root mu epsilon, just like we had before. Now, instead of having k, you are having jk multiplied by a correction factor, which is 1 plus sigma divided by j omega epsilon. And this gives what we call a complex wave number for that particular wave. Now, for a wave that is propagating in a positive z direction, we can therefore write a solution of the form that E is going to be given by x cap E naught exponent of minus gamma z equal to x cap E naught exponent of minus alpha z exponent of minus j beta z. And now we see that the amplitude of the wave that is propagating in its in the direction of propagation is no longer constant that we as we had in the lossy medium, but now it's it will be decaying as we move along because alpha will always be taken as positive for physical fields because otherwise if alpha was negative would see that increasing meaning that the medium is active it's generating energy which is not true in physics and therefore this wave is no longer a uniform plane wave but because the amplitude is changing and it moves along the direction of propagation now the electric losses that are due to the conduction current can also be accounted for by defining a complex permittivity of the medium as epsilon equal to a real part epsilon prime minus j epsilon double prime. The reason why we are using this minus sign is because epsilon will appear in the energy equations as j omega multiplied by epsilon, uh, by epsilon here. And therefore, for it to lose energy or to dissipate power from circuit theory, We've been told that power dissipation is positive, power generation is negative. And therefore, we are using a minus sign because when we multiply the j, multiply by minus j, we get a positive sign. And therefore, this will be a real value that will represent power dissipation. So, similarly, if the material was magnetic and it had losses in the magnetization, the phase component, Okay, and out of phase component the magnetization of that material, then we could also express mu as mu equal to the real part, mu prime minus j mu double prime. However, mu double prime is usually much larger than mu, uh, the mu prime is usually much larger than mu double prime in most dielectric materials, apart from uh, even for the magnetic ones. So we can always write that mu is approximately mu double prime or mu double prime and therefore we replace we drop down the, uh, the mu prime in our expressions so that we don't have to deal with them but remember if we put it in place which i'll ask you to do that is you multiply j omega mu multiplied by j omega epsilon and you take the value of epsilon as epsilon prime minus j epsilon double prime and mu by mu prime minus j mu double prime, we'll see that the mu double prime will represent a series resistance per unit length that you met in uh, the transmission lines before. So, and therefore, we can therefore write this as gamma is equal to j omega mu double prime mu prime times epsilon prime into one minus j epsilon double prime over epsilon prime. Now the ratio epsilon double prime by epsilon prime is usually called the loss tangent because it is a measure of the power loss in that medium. It's the reason why we get a power factor in a 
in your in your expressions for power in power systems. So if you were to define delta L as the angle or the loss angle of that medium, then the tangent or the loss uh, the loss tangent tan delta L is going to be given by epsilon double prime over epsilon, which we are saying that this would be equivalent to a conductivity sigma, and therefore we can divide that one by omega epsilon double uh, single prime here that is left out. And now the gamma squared is going to be given by alpha squared minus beta squared plus J2 alpha beta. That is, we are using alpha, gamma is equal to alpha plus J beta, we square it, and this is what we get. And this we can equate to the value of gamma squared, which we saw was going to be given by J omega mu into sigma plus J omega epsilon, or J omega mu into J omega epsilon minus J epsilon double prime. This is what we have opened up the brackets with. So, therefore, we can see that we can express the real part of gamma as just being the minus of omega squared mu multiplied by epsilon, double, uh, epsilon prime. And the imaginary part will be equal to that value there. And therefore, we can get define alpha in terms of beta as omega squared mu epsilon double prime over twice beta. Now, we are going to place this one in the equation for gamma squared, okay? And we get a value of beta squared minus omega squared multiplied by that beta squared and multiplied by that. And if you look at this, now this looks like a quadratic equation in beta squared, and therefore we'll solve that one, and we get a value of omega squared into that, you equal to one plus that value. Now, because beta, is expected to be real in the, in the definition for gamma, beta should be a, a real value, and therefore we just take the value of the positive or the sum value of that rather than the, sub, the subtraction, because we know that even if, even if this epsilon, this epsilon double prime is a real value, and therefore this square root will always be larger than that value, that unity. So if we do a minus, we'll get a minus value for beta squared, and therefore we'll get beta squared, uh, beta becoming an imaginary value. And therefore we must add, or we must use the positive value in the radicant there. And that's why we have that for the beta, just going to be given by that, okay? In, a, in the same way, we can always express beta in terms of alpha, and we get a, an expression for alpha or uh, in terms of quadratic expression in terms of alpha square. And again, solution gives us that value. And if you look at this minus sign, plus or minus, if we use the minus sign, we'll get this thing becoming minus and alpha will become imaginary. And therefore we just use the addition because this is going to be larger than unity anyway. And therefore we get an alpha equal to that square root minus one, multiplied by that value there, okay? So, an example. A sinusoidal electric field intensity of amplitude 250 volt per meter and frequency of one gigahertz is exists in a lossy medium with a relative permittivity of 2.5 and a loss tangent of 10 raised to minus three. We are saying lossy dielectric, and therefore we know that this will be, will have no free charges in it, but it will have the damping losses coming from its polarization. So what we are required to do is to find the average power by unit volume that is dissipated in that medium. So how we attack this is to look at the effective conductivity of that medium. What would it be? We know that the epsilon double prime can be expressed as sigma divided by omega epsilon, where the epsilon here is the real part of the 
of the permittivity. And therefore, you can see that the sigma is just going to be 0 0.139 millisiemens per meter, where we are multiplying the twice pi f, multiplied by epsilon, okay? And, if have, and multiplying by the tangent, uh, the tangent or the loss tangent of 10, uh, 10 to the minus 3, and we'll get that value there. Now, the average dissipated power per unit volume will therefore be given by a half multiplied by the, conduct, uh, the conduction current and multiplied by the electric. This would be in amps per meter, uh, per meter square, and that will be in volts per meter, and therefore we'll have this as power divided by volume, and we get that it's going to be given by 1 over 2 sigma, or the conductivity, multiplied by E squared, and we get a value of 4.34 watt per meter cube. Now, what I, this is just uh, as a by the way, and we say that for a microwave oven, food, it will cook food by irradiating the food with a microwave field that is generated by uh, an oscillator which is called a magnetron operating at a frequency of 2.45 gigahertz. This is the allocation for microwave ovens from the uh, frequency allocation as controlled by the ITU. Now, a piece of beef would be characterized by a an epsilon r of about 40 but we know that for beef of course as the beef is uh, raw it will be juicier so the its epsilon will be smaller and as you heat it up and it dries up a little bit the epsilon r should increase or decrease or should increase so to speak but we are going to use this average value and the loss tangent is large it's about 0 0.35 so the power that will be dissipated in that stick per unit volume would therefore work out to about 59.6 kilowatt per meter cube. I'll give you uh, a minute to try and see whether you can get that value. So please try to work through that expression using, okay, get the, the value of sigma and the value of the and use the 250 millivolts per meter as the electric field and see what value you get for that kind of value there. Did you get the task? So have you proved, uh, proved the, the value? Okay, fine. That's nice. That's correct. So, we continue with our discussion and look at the low loss media. Low loss media are characterized by the expression that the conductivity sigma is much smaller than. That is, that is, if we were to look at the, this, uh, the conduction current and we look at the displacement current density in that medium, 
the displacement current will be much larger than the conduction current. That would be called a low loss dielectrics. And always what we are trying to do in our choice for dielectric material is material in which that expression is true or valid. Therefore, if we were to write gamma in its form, as we saw it before, all we are saying is that sigma over j omega epsilon is a small value, and we can therefore use binomial theorem, ex uh, binomial expansion of this expression, and we can express it in that form. And we get it going to infinity. But if sigma by omega epsilon is very small, then we can expect that the square or the cube or the higher powers are going to be even smaller. And therefore, we can just truncate this value at the first, at the, for, and in the, the, by taking the first three terms of that expansion. And therefore, we get that gamma is going to be given by j omega root mu epsilon into 1 minus j sigma by 2 omega epsilon plus 1 over 8 and sigma by omega epsilon all squared. Remember, the epsilon I'm using here is the real part of epsilon, okay? Because now we are, the op epsilon double prime, we replace it by the sigma by j omega, by omega epsilon here, to get that value. So, what would be the value of alpha? Obtain an expression for alpha in that case then. And a value for beta. You do have a minute to do this. And uh, whoever gets it can actually talk back so that you can hear your voice a bit. Anyone obtained an expression? Uh, yes, I've got an alpha is uh, sigma over epsilon times mm -hmm. square root of mu epsilon. Mm -hmm. And beta is uh, j omega times square root of mu epsilon into 1 minus an eighth uh, mm -hmm. sigma over omega epsilon squared. Yeah, okay, let's see whether you got it right. I have it down here. So you, if you got that kind of value, okay, you should be, you should be whatever in yourself, you can give yourself a, a nice, a nice whatever clap on the chest or the, or the shoulder. So that's what we we'll get, that is, we get a, a frequency dependent attenuation of that wave or attenuation factor alpha. Now, the phase factor is of course going to be given by that value. And we can always see that it's going to be given by the, ta the loss tangent as well. And therefore, it's no longer, since this may be dependent, if you look, if we were to replace epsilon double prime with its frequency, okay, well, the sigma by omega epsilon value, you see that this value will be varying again by omega in here, square, and we have an omega there. And it's no longer a linear, a linear expression. It can go down to, it can now introduce distortion in signals that contain different frequency components. So, the intrinsic impedance of that low loss medium, where we say that the intrinsic it would be the, the intrinsic impedance of a lossless medium 
with constitutive parameters mu by epsilon prime multiplied by the correction of the the, the, the complex permittivity that you get there. And therefore, eta there has a phase factor. Before we saw that the intrinsic impedance was, was real, P1 is real, it was ohmic. For free space, we said it was 120 pi ohms. But now we see we introduce a phase factor into it because of the losses. So it becomes a complex impedance. So the phase velocity will be given by omega divided by the phase propagation constant. It's not omega by gamma, but it's omega by the phase factor or the phase propagation factor in gamma. That is the imaginary part of gamma. And we see that that is going to be given by the speed of light multiplied by the correction factor that we have there, where we have used binomial expansion of one over one plus one eighth of epsilon double prime by epsilon prime all squared. So we, and we have retained only the first two values of that. And therefore we see that VP is no longer a constant value, but it's a corrected value with frequency as they move, as the wave propagates through the, the medium. And therefore we expect a signal made up of several frequency components the higher frequencies will be moving at lower uh, at different frequencies as the lower as the lower frequency ones components and therefore we expect them to start separating and that's why if you look in the sky the short man above said what that by this sign it's my commitment that i'll never kill you guys with uh, with floods again isn't it the rainbow the rainbow is because the permittivity of air depends on frequency and especially when the air is wet the, 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 whatever the differences uh, of the permittivity or the dependence of permittivity on frequency will become larger and therefore we see a separation of the color component of the frequency components in the daylight and it separates into those seven colors that you call the seven colors of the rainbow. Now, if the medium was a good conductor, then we would expect that the conduction current will be, will be much larger than the displacement current. And therefore, gamma is going to be given by alpha plus J beta, which is equal to J omega into root mu epsilon into that value there. And what we are saying is that that value, that is sigma by omega epsilon, is going to be much larger than unity and we can remove that one we can drop out the unity and we just get the square root of sigma by j omega and if we multiply this value through okay what we'll get is just the root of j omega epsilon uh, j omega mu uh, uh, mu multiplied by sigma and we take the square root now like we said j is the square root of minus one. Minus one can ex be expressed in terms of the trigonometric or the exponent of j pi by, by, by uh, as uh, e raised to j pi will give you the minus one. If we take its square root, then j is going to be given by ex the exponent of j pi by two or the angle of 90 degrees, which is the sine. And therefore, the square root of j can be taken as the square root of exponent of j pi by 2. We get exponent of j pi by 4. And that one is cosine pi by 4 plus j sine by 4, which is the cosine, the cosine of pi by 4 is the cosine of 45 degrees. We know that that is going to be 1 over root 2. And therefore, we just get, and the sine of 45 is also 1 over root 2, and therefore, we get 1 plus j over root 2 multiplied by the omega mu epsilon uh, sigma all squared. And therefore, you can take the root 2 inside and you get 1 plus j root of omega mu sigma divided by 2.
And now we see that the real part and the imaginary part, that is alpha and beta are equal in that good conductor. So usually this is expressed as pi f mu sigma, that is where we put this, this as twice pi multiplied by the frequency and mu multiplied by sigma. And we define this as one over delta s, because where delta s is just twice over omega mu sigma, it's called the skin depth or the depth of penetration of that field into the good conductor. If we had a wave that was leaving, say, a dielectric and impinging on a good conductor, then as long as the good conductor had a, or a, a thickness in the direction of propagation larger than delta s, we expect that as the wave goes into the conductor, it will be attenuated at a value of one del of delta s, that is z over delta s, where z is the direction of the distance into the conductor, and it will be decaying, and it can, uh, by the time it goes to z equal to delta s, it will have decayed to one over epsilon, or one over e, which is the one over the base, the, log the natural log uh, logarithm base, which is 2.718 and so forth. And therefore, this is usually called the characteristic depth of penetration or the skin depth. And this, and the, as the frequency is increased, we see that the delta S becomes smaller, and at infinity, delta S should be just almost zero. And therefore, we expect the depth of penetration to decrease with speed uh, with the frequency of the signal and therefore we can call this skin effect so like we have said that it would be a characteristic of the medium itself and depends on frequency of the signal that we are dealing with so the intrinsic impedance of a good conductor will therefore be given by the square root of mu by epsilon and this is going to be given by j omega mu by sigma, which is equal to one plus j into root of omega f mu over sigma. Remember that epsilon that we are dealing with here is epsilon, the real part, plus the imaginary part, which was sigma over j omega epsilon. And therefore what we get is that you get a value of one plus j alpha over sigma, and we can see that this is going to be given by one plus j over delta multiplied by sigma s. If you, this is a distance, that is a conductance per unit length, okay? And therefore, when we multiply them, it's going to be a conductance, and when we take it to the top, it's going to be a, an, a, an impedance. And therefore, we see that the impedance has, has an angle of 45 degrees, okay? And it's inductive because the, the, the real, uh, the imaginary part is positive, so it's a positive reactance, and therefore it will be inductive with the real part, with a real and imaginary part that are equal. The phase velocity is given by omega over beta, and it's just going to be given by twice omega over mu uh, sigma, and the wavelength of the wave is just going to be given by twice pi by beta, which we see is going to be two by pi by f mu sigma. Because of the attenuation factor, alpha z, when the wave is moving in the more positive z direction, a high frequency electromagnetic wave will be attenuated rapidly in the direction of propagation as it goes into the good conductor. So the distance delta s through which the amplitude of the wave drops by a factor one by E, where E is the base of the natural log, is called the skin depth or the depth of penetration in that particular conductor at that frequency of uh, that frequency of interest. So the confinement of the wave to the surface of a good conductor within a skin depth is therefore called skin effect. And since alpha and beta are equal, you can see that the, the skin depth is the same as one over alpha in meters, or you can take it as one over beta, which is lambda by twice pi in 
wavelength. So it requires lambda is the wavelength of the wave inside that good conductor. So we look at that expression and you see that the, uh, the example is that the electric field intensity of a linearly polarized uniform plane wave propagating in the z direction in seawater is given by E equal to x cap 100 multiplied by cos pi multiplied by 10 raised to 7 of T volts per meter at the surface, which is our z equal to zero reference point. Now, if you are given that seawater has an epsilon r of about 72, remember epsilon r is just a relative permittivity. We must multiply that one by permittivity of free space to get the actual permittivity in water, in the seawater. And its sigma is four Siemens per meter. So we are required to determine the attenuation constant, the phase constant, the phase velocity, wavelength, and the skin depth in the water two we are supposed to get we find the distance at which the amplitude of p is just going to be one percent of its value at the surface and then we obtain an expression of e and h in terms of distance traveled and time at a depth at a depth of 0.8 Meters. That is at 0 0.8 meters below the surface of the ocean or the surface of the, of the sea, so to speak. So the first thing you do is that you look at what you have in your, in your expression on your problem. You write down the things that you have been given. Now, we've been given omega. We can always see the omega as the pi multiplied by 10 raised to that. And we know that omega is twice pi f. And therefore, f is going to be given that value divided by twice pi, and we get a value of 5 megahertz. So that's the frequency of our of the of the signal that we are sending down into the water. This would be, say, for example, an application of a fisherman trying to detect a school of fish when he's fishing. So you can send a signal down, which will be bounced bounced back by the school of fish and you can detect it. So we want to see how deep can our signal go. So we get that, therefore, we can get a value or to try and see whether seawater is a good conductor, we can treat it as a good conductor or a dielectric. So this is usually an important thing to do because it always tells you what kind of assumptions you can make in your solution. Otherwise, you'll have to do a solution that is too detailed than necessary. So if we take the ratio, we see that that ratio is about 200. And we can say that this 200 is much greater than unity, and therefore seawater can be regarded as good, a good conductor. We shall see that in engineering, if, us, if one quantity is at least 10 times larger than the another quantity, we can always say that that quantity is larger than that other quantity. And we can always make some kind of uh, assumptions about it and ignore the smaller one and we'll just make a 10 percent error in our solution so in seawater we can we can say that that is a good conductor and therefore we can use the expressions we have found for alpha in beta and we see them as 8.89 nepas per meter and 8.89 radians per meter you can divide this by pi then you get beta in terms of a number multiplied by pi radians. It's usually much better to have it with a pi because beta always appears where there are always pi's, okay? And some of the pi's can always uh, cancel each other out. It makes it a better expression. So the impedance or the intrinsic impedance is of course going to be given by that value one plus j root pi f by z, multiplied by that and multiplied by that and vp equal to 3.53 uh, 3 times 10 raised to 6 meters per second, about 100 times lower than the speed of light. Then we have lambda is going to be given by 12 pi over beta, and we get a 0 0.7 uh, to 7. This is almost 1 over the square root of 2. And the delta S is just simply 0 0.112 meters. Okay, Distance Z 
at uh, at one, where e is one percent. That's why I'm writing a z subscript zero point zero one. It's where e is one percent of the amplitude at the surface. It's just going to be given by the attenuation factor is going to be zero point zero one, and you get that that is going to be zero point five one eight meters. And see, this will be given by that value there, and we multiply. We say that we multiply the phasor expression by the exponent of j omega t, the omega t is missing here, and then we take the real part of it and we get that that is just going to be given by that value, omega t, and the e at 8, 0 0.8 is going just to be multiply that beta by 0 0.8 and we get that value there as a phase. And the h is going to be given by the z, that is the direction unit vector, cross the E field divided by the intrinsic impedance of the medium, and we get that value coming out, out as that value there. So what I want you to do is that uh, attempt the same expression or the same example without assuming that the seawater is a good conductor. Use the values as they are and try to get those expressions that we have got, had for those solutions. Compare them with our assumption and satisfy yourself that that assumption will be valid. Okay? That's what I want you to do. And we, you can give me the answers tomorrow. So with that, I think my time is up. And therefore, I'll uh, stop there. Tomorrow we shall be looking at ionized plasmas, which is just a, a medium which has free electron or free negative and positive charges with in the same uh, kind of whatever at the same concentration, so to speak. This is usually important, especially in the ionosphere, which is about 50 to 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface. This is something we shall look at tomorrow. So with that, the task is re rework example four without the assumptions given. That is get the actual value. So with that, then I'll, uh, in case there are no questions, we can always then call, call it a day until tomorrow. That is, unless you have any question. The recordings for, when was that? 13th, 13th of uh, October. I don't think we, we didn't have a lecture on 13th of October because we started on the 15th, isn't it? No? Yeah, it was the 15th of October, that's when we started. And I thought that one I already shared, but I'll try to see and uh, see uh, and share it with you after this. Okay. So in case there are no, uh, there are no questions, which about the others? I've, I've sent those others. And even the slides, I've always, I've been sharing the slides on uh, Google Drive. So you should be looking at the Google Drive. I, I don't send them again on uh, Google Classroom. And these guys who are trying to join when we are finished, I don't know what it is they want. So anyway, with that, if there are no other further questions, then we can call it a day. And I'll send you this particular one after the corrections that I've noticed, the typos that I've noticed in the, in the slides. I'll send it, the corrected one. So with that, then do have a nice day, and we meet tomorrow at 9. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.